Maybe I should put my reading glasses so, on. Um, give me a second. Also, thank you everyone who's joined. We weren't expecting this many people, to be honest. <laughs> so this is awesome. <laughs> and all over the country, if not all over the continent. Yeah, yeah. it's neat. Yeah. Terrific. yeah, it's great to see everyone. So I think we can get started. I want to welcome everyone for showing up to our first live stream. Um, I'm Annie, uh, the co-pres of BMCAA, and Lisa, the other co-pres, is going to be hosting today. Hello. Um, so before we get started, we just want to go over some housekeeping. Um, we're going to ask that everyone be on mute in order to minimize the background noise. Um, and then you can type your questions into the chat and we will um, relay them to Ryan. Uh, we also have some news. So unfortunately, the 75th gala will be um, delayed to next year uh, due to COVID. Um, we will keep everyone updated as to um, how that is, uh, the planning of that and the final dates once we figure everything out. Um, so there's that. Also, we do have a um, membership subscription. Um, so we will send out details about that in terms of like how to be a member of um, BMCAA and um, uh, in terms of like sponsorship. And um, also uh, included with that is the U book. And so I'll send, we'll send out um, more details about this as well. Um, and as per our last email, we. Uh, uh, we did send out an uh, anti-racism feedback form. Um, so if anyone has any comments or um, concerns, feel free to fill that out. We will also be circulating it uh, along with our emails for the next few weeks. Um, and lastly, uh, we would like to do a land acknowledgement. Um, so I'm gonna hand it off to Danny. Hi, uh, yeah, so I'm Danny. Um, so as part of kind of the BMCA's um, anti-racism initiative and kind of efforts to work on decolonizing our industry a little bit, uh, we wanted to start integrating a land acknowledgement into kind of the start of our events. Um, so I'm going to read one today that's been um, provided by the university, but I also um, would like to kind of acknowledge that these statements are meant to also kind of serve as a time for reflection about our own kind of ongoing relationship with the land and our own indigenous communities. Um, so we, the BMCA exec team, um, and hopefully everyone else here, uh, wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron, Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Um, yeah, thanks. All right, thank you, Danny. And then without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Ryan, our um, feature today. Uh, so he graduated in 2018 from BMC and currently works at Click as an animator. Um, he will also, today he'll be sharing um, portraiture techniques. Um, and he, uh, we will also be compiling uh, a list of resources that will be sent out in an email uh, to all the people that registered. So um, if you do want to get on the, that list, do remember to register or just email us. Um, so yeah, thank you, Ryan, for being here. And we're very excited. Hey, thanks, Annie. Um, yeah, so my name is Ryan, and I'm from class 28. I currently work as a medical animator slash illustrator at uh, Quick Health in Toronto. And um, I have always loved Ever since I started drawing, I've always loved uh, the figure and portraiture. And um, I didn't go to art school as such, like many of our alumni, but um, I did attend an atelier for a couple of years and I studied uh, in classes with uh, Robert Liberace, who I think is probably the best figurative artist on the East Coast uh, in the US. I guess Canada would be included. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm. I'm going to, I want to share with you guys, um, not like the basics of portraiture really, because there's just too much. If you want to co uh, cover portraiture exhaustively, it's more than a one hour session. So I just thought I would bring to attention uh, things that people might not know 
about portraiture and maybe like little things I've seen in um, others people, other people's work that um, could be improved upon or like could, or like little um, thoughts that could help them observe what they are seeing when they are drawing a person. Um, okay, so to start off, uh, the, the very basics is if you are learning or studying portraiture, you need a good reference, right? So whether um, that's in person or a photo, uh, <clears throat> when you are studying, you want a reference that has a single light source, right? Um, and you want the light raking across the face because that is able to show the dimensions uh, of, the, of the face more clearly. And um, you want to squint when you're looking at this. So the whole time, so as you are drawing, you know, as you, as you start to draw the person's uh, portrait, you want to, when you squint down, you get rid of all the extraneous details and you're able to figure out what it is that you actually need uh, to draw, right? And so squinting is an integral part of that. Um, so you want, to, you want to be squinting periodically throughout uh, the drawing of the portrait. So those are, those are the absolute basics. And I cannot say this enough, but I think uh, this right here, squinting, is the most important thing. Um, if you can somehow like, you know, just control your eyes so you're squinting really hard in the beginning, and then you just squint less and less over time until you get to the very end, uh, it's probably going to help your portraiture immensely. Um, so uh, first things, uh, I just want to talk about some basic relationships uh, in the features of the face that have always uh, helped me. And um, so uh, these two here, this one and this one, is this bright enough? No, no maybe this one. this one and this one. Um, these are what I consider sort of like the triangle of the face. So this center triangle of the face is where all the likeness is in a person. The, the lower half of the face where the mouth is changes constantly depending on whether the person is tense or relaxed or is speaking. So the lower half quite isn't that important. It's important, but not that important. The most important part is the triangle of the face right here. So if you can get this distance between the sides of the features or this, uh, like this accurately, uh, you're more likely to come to some sort of likeness. Um, uh, here, I just have the relationship between the sides of the nose and the sides of the mouth here. Uh, this, is, this is what I use to keep, it, uh, keep track of like how wide the mouth should be. Otherwise, your mouth will be too small or uh, grow too large. Um, usually, when you are looking at a face, you can see that the inside of the eye aligns with uh, the nostril in some way. Um, if she had her held, head, head tilted, of course, then the relationship would be more slanted. But this, when it's like so easy like this, just a perfect straight drop down, uh, this is a good way of checking to see if your nose and eye spacing uh, is done well. And combined with the prior, um, uh, this like trapezoid or this triangle, combined with this, um, if you can get these right, then you'll, you know, everything, you'll, you will have nailed the likeness within here. And, there's much more leeway for you to sort of make small mistakes elsewhere in the portrait. Um, this next one is just sort of, you know, how big the ear should be and where it should be placed. So uh, when I look at the ear, uh, the way I think of it is I think of the head as just a big cylinder. And so when you are, if you just draw parallel lines through the cylinder, sort of cutting through cross, cross sections, uh, that's how I'm sort of seeing the brow, the bottom of the nose here. So, and then the ear gets placed. The ear, the ear gets placed within that. So, within those two. Um, and this next part, pretty self-explanatory, but you know, something I still make mistakes on. Um, so, uh, you know, when you have, when you're looking at a person, especially if you're looking at uh, sort of like the outline outside edge of their face. It's always good to make notes on uh, where the furthest point out of their face is, and then see in relation to like what other parts of 
uh, prominent features like the cheekbones here are in relation to her uh, brow, for instance, in this example. So if you can keep track of those, um, you're less likely to do things like, you know, drawing her, her cheek out too much, which helps destroy the likeness. Um, and finally, of course, uh, all the features of the face, except for the mouth, if they're making an expression. Um, and sometimes the, the nose as well, if they're pulling with the muscles uh, on the side of their face. But more or less, you, know, you wanna keep track of the uh, parallel nature of the features. The features, especially when they're relaxed, are always parallel. So this is another way you can keep track of uh, the face looking cohesive. So another thing I wanted to say about just observation uh, was that you can get likeness uh, just from shadow, right? So this is, this is Cara Delvin, I think. I just pulled this photo off of Instagram. All these photos are just pulled off Instagram, or not Instagram, sorry, uh, Pinterest more or less. Um, so I think this is Cara Delvin, and I just did a version of her where I just outlined the shadows. I squinted at the photo and I just drew the shadows. Um, and at least to me anyways, uh, there is an immediate likeness just by looking at the shadows. Um, and this is why I say squint, because if you squint and you can place the shadows, even, you know, even if you place the features not so quite right, you will still retain more likeness than if you didn't place the shadows correctly. I feel like the shadows are the easiest way to get likeness uh, in a person's face. And here, um, I've taken this model and I've done, you know, this literally took me like two minutes, you know, one minute, two minutes, just uh, very roughly uh, getting her uh, shadows in place. And uh, it's not a great likeness, but you can see there is a rough likeness. And um, these are two different techniques. Um, uh, this one, I just took the outline of the shadows and I just drew in all the outlines and a little bit of her features, so her eyes but, and her eyebrows, but the rest of this is just shadow shapes. And this one um, uh, was also just shadows. And then I just, I didn't even put in the eyes like in here, for instance, I just filled it in. And despite it not having eyes, it almost feels like she has eyes, right? Um, so you can get, you can see the likeness between, uh, between this one and this, uh, mostly just from shadows. So, um, so observation is great. And observation is the foundation of uh, what we do in portraiture. Uh, but the next thing, which I think completely changed how I drew portraiture, is what I call construction. So uh, I want to just go over uh, some small things with regards to construction. So the first thing is, um, I think the, uh, so when we look at this skull here, the, the eyes and the nose are pretty self-explanatory, we all know this. And I think sort of this cutout in this sphere with this uh, brow rhythm here, this is sort of self-explanatory self too. The one thing I wanted to speak about in particular was the mouth here. Um, this, was, this was new to me when I, saw, when I first saw this. And it's basically the idea that the mouth is like the uh, side of a sphere, like a lemon or something that's been just cut out like this. So this is sort of like the shape of our mouth. Um, and so this, uh, this is helpful because it sort of explains the round nature of our mouth. Sometimes, you know, if, you, if you're drawing a pair of lips, uh, you, don't, you don't draw them on a plane uh, like this, right? Well, you're not supposed to, right? The, the, lips, the lips reside on a, a round plane, which means that uh, you have overlap happening and wrapping around that occurs. Um, so, so that's all I wanted to say about uh, this little drawing here. And um, I wanted to speak a little bit about landmarks. So these, um, maybe it's a little bit embarrassing, but these took me a while to understand myself. So I let me just point them out. So you see this young man here, and we see all these bumps and stuff across his face. Uh, and we see all these highlights, but we don't, um, 
we don't necessarily assign the right uh, meaning to them when we see them. But if you understand a little bit about the skull itself, or if you remember what the skull looks like, um, for example, you would know that this zygomatic uh, form right here, the bone, is corresponds to this little bit of shadow that we're seeing here, right here, right? Um, and so if you're drawing this face, if you ignore this form when you're doing the shading, uh, you're losing a little bit of his actual likeness. But if you understand what you're seeing in terms of what's underneath the skin, the form of the bone, uh, you will notice that and you will put that in. Um, so a few other ones is the, uh, the side of his temple right here. This is very distinct bone that uh, comes up. The, uh, the lower orbital, so this area right here, this is, we are looking at his eye socket here. So, and you can see, you can see the light form that moves down like this. And that's corresponding uh, to his lower orbital here. And also his brow. So see these two areas of light up here? That's his bone sh uh, showing through his flesh, through his brow. Uh, and finally, I guess I should say uh, this widening form here, this widening form is the junction between his nasal bone and then the cartilage of the rest of his nose. And you should also see a uh, little movement. It's a little bit brighter here. It gets a little bit dull and then it gets bright again. That movement in the highlight is due to the fact that it's transitioning from the bone into the nasal, into the nasal cartilage. So that's also something uh, to observe. So uh, the thing that I really want to get to uh, when it comes to the, uh, the face, when it comes to construction anyways, is something called the Riley method. Uh, I'm not, I don't actually remember the exact history of the Riley method. I think it was made by some guy named Frank Riley. I mean, all this artistic tradition is passed through years and years of other people's experimentation and refinement. And I think he taught at some art school in uh, New York, some big art school in New York. And um, I learned this tradition through um, a man named Jeffrey Watts uh, online. And Jeffrey Watts learned it from his father and his father, I think, learned it from Frank Riley. So you will see variations of this uh, Riley method here. Um, you'll see glimpses of it if you look into portraiture throughout the internet and everyone has their own version. Uh, the thing about the Riley method is that it's not really something that you use to uh, draw a person every single time. It's more like a mental map. It's a mental map of sort of the superficial uh, rhythms of the face that make up a person's face. And it allows you to uh, piece together features in a harmonious way, right? And that harmony will help you, even if you don't get perfect likeness, the face will feel right. You won't have the feeling of uh, things being out of place in a face. Uh, so uh, in these examples, I've drawn a Riley map uh, across the faces here. Um, and I'm going to draw for you. I, um, I will provide links uh, after this that will show you how to draw a Riley face, at least for a front on view. I don't actually know the procedure for drawing uh, this three quarter and the side view. Um, I just know the way it looks. But knowing this map will help your portraiture. You will start to see these uh, sort of invisible lines in someone's face. So I'm going to start. So first, um, you start with a circle. And we're moving pretty quickly. So um, if you can't keep up, don't worry. There will be uh, a very helpful YouTube video that uh, does this uh, very cleanly. and. Um, I'm going to mark off the uh, top of the forehead here. And I'm going to find the same distance, mark off the bottom of the nose, and then another distance down, and we are going to get to the bottom of the jaw. So from here, I'm going to mark down uh, the eye line. This is just sort of a guess. And um, we can also uh, mark the bridge or 
the, this little keystone shape, which is your brow. This is called the glabella. No, I don't need to label that, it's okay. And um, here I'm going to put some rhythm, rhythms for the outside of the eyes on either side. And it needs a lower rhythm as well. And um, there is a circular rhythm that goes from the bottom of the glabella to the top of the forehead. And this is called the front talus. So you can actually see this in this young man. It runs through this, it goes like this. And you can sort of see it, there is, it's, it's rounder and highlighted here and it gets darker here like this. And that's because of the, uh, the uh, bone rhythm running through. Um, and then let's see, we want to draw on the eyes. And uh, we'll draw the actual bottom of the nose, the cartilage bottom. And we'll bring these forms down to the nose. And then we can draw the rhythm for the, the outside of the nose here. Uh, and let's make a guess at the side, the jaw. Um, all right, let's round out the side of the eyes. And then for the side of the head here, we start from uh, the, the side of the eye here, bring up the rhythm here. Uh, we can also start cleaning up and drawing planar change that happens at the, from the side of the head to the forehead. Oops. And one more for top of the head. Okay. Uh, now um, we can make a guess for about the size of the chin. And then we're going to put in the rhythm, rhythm lines for the inside of the mouth or the inner part of the mouth, this, what I will call the muzzle form. Um, and then here's the outer part of the muzzle form. So you will see this in human beings. I know it's weird to refer to human beings as having a muzzle, like a dog, but we do indeed have a muzzle. And some of us, it's pushed out more, and others, it's much receded. And let's put in the form for the middle of the nose here. Okay, um, and uh, I'm gonna draw the mouth over here and draw the upper rhythm for the top of the lip and draw the philtrum right here. Uh, now uh, here's, I'm gonna draw two rhythm lines that I have found the most useful uh, personally for me. And this, is, and this helps kind of explain the area of the cheek when I'm looking at somebody. So you start from the corner of the mouth and you just bring it up straight through to the, to the almost eye level like that. So this goes from the corner of the mouth to the eye level right here. And this is the top of your ear. And there's another one at the, usually around the middle of your jaw right here. Oh, my Photoshop's being weird. There we go. And we pull that up and we sort of follow the same curve, but it's the bottom. And all the bottom of the nose here for the ear. So that's the ear. So this here for me helps explain uh, the cheek because usually the cheek feels like kind of, sort of like this weird floating section um, of the skull. But these forms, I see these swooping forms on people's cheeks all the time now. Let's do this one. I'm going to do this one quickly. Okay, so, oh, and one last part is the, the brow, the, I actually don't know what this form is called, but there's another raised form for the brow right here. And usually cut out like this. 
So this this is a Riley. Oops, this is a Riley head. It's not that pretty. I apologize. Um, the the thing I like about the Riley head is that you can do you can take a head like this, and um, all you need to do is just uh, like if I just pretend there is light coming in from the top. This sort of explains all of that just by itself. And here's the below the bottom lip. And I guess you could fill this in like this if you want. Hi, Ryan. We have a yeah. question from the audience. Sure. Does the Riley method work for expressive faces? Yes, it does. Um, you just, uh, all of these are not set in stone. These all move with the face. So it definitely works for an expressive face. Um, you know what, actually, I will list a video uh, that I've seen on YouTube that shows them using the Riley method for stuff like caricature. Um, yeah, but it definitely works for expressive faces. And one more question. How do you start working this mental model into drawings and practice? Okay, so uh, the way you would do that is, well, first you have to internalize this thing. Um, so basically what I did was I just watched the person <laughs> making this face over and over again, and I just copied him until I memorized it. And then once you do that, um, you can start taking portraits of people like this, and you can just start uh, drawing the Riley method on top of that. And when you're doing that, you will start to notice um, that certain patterns of like light and dark correspond to uh, different areas of the Riley face, or like sort of like, you know, if you're looking at him face on, uh, you may not understand quite what's going on through this part here, right? But uh, with the Riley method, you can see that this there's movement here like this in his face, right? It gives you a better, like a, like a smooth three-dimensional understanding of what's going on in their face. Um, and that's what I find it really useful for. You see this rhythm right here, it's corresponding to this rhythm right here, right? These normally without the Riley method, I would probably be more lost. I would be trying to just copy these. Uh, but when I'm, when I'm looking at this face and rendering this face, I'm thinking about the Riley method. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. This is supposed to be here because that corresponds to this section, this area um, of the Riley face. Um, yeah. Is there any other questions or? No? Okay. All right, so uh, this next part, I'm gonna play a, um, a video uh, I did a realistic portrait last night um, with a uh, with a reference, and I'm going to just uh, commentate over the video. At the end, I will do a um, a demonstration, but that will not be a realistic portrait. This one took me probably three and a half hours, I think. So um, there is no way that I'm going to <laughs> get fast enough to fit that all in an hour or 20 minutes, as it may be. Okay. Oops. Okay, so here we go. So this model was provided to me uh, by uh, Chelsea. And I'm going to play it now. I did it on my iPad. Okay, so first things first. Um, I, I put in light lines to help uh, just, just to get a feel for the um, size of our face. And I'm starting to put in some features, but I'm going to get it wrong. I don't mind getting it wrong when I'm working digitally because you can move features around. Um, but you can see the first thing I'm doing here is I put in the features, but I'm starting to put in shadow shapes. Uh, it's shadow shape on the side of her nose, uh, a little bit in her brow here and around her mouth. So this, these shadow shapes are helping me figure out whether I've gotten her look properly or not. And I put in the eyes because um, the eyes usually, they're not exactly a shadow shape, although there are shadows in them, but the eyes sort of uh, help you figure out whether you've got the model as well. At least it does for me. 
So I will continue working here and just putting in more shadow shapes, putting in some anatomy, putting in the ears, start filling out the shadow shapes here. So I start filling out the shadow shapes and it gives me a clear idea if I'm on the right path. Um, just continue working. I'm starting to shade a little bit more. So I'm, this is me just sort of creeping up to the portrait, trying to feel if I'm uh, going the right way. And now that I started putting in shadow shapes, I realized that I need to put in um, more tone around her face to make sure that I'm not uh, getting carried away with my value as I continue to work. So this is why I start uh, working on other parts of her, her face. So her hair is extremely curly. So you'll just see me just putting in little random squiggles and just building and building and building. Um, just because it, it needs that kind of building. If I just go in with a single brush stroke, um, it's going to uh, be too heavy handed, ham handed for how much texture there is in her face. So here, I, I change her face multiple times. So here it looks like I think the nose is too long. The eye has been off kilter this entire time. Her head is at a slight angle and I haven't respected that up until this point. I think it's still not quite right. So I don't know if you've noticed, but I am working on all different areas of her face um, this entire time. And I should have said something a little bit earlier. Um, if you look at the way, if you look at the way I shade her face, You'll see that I work in sort of like this circular pattern when I start shading into her face. Um, and that's because I am reserving the brightest areas of her face for last. I don't want to get those too dark. Uh, to, you have to preserve the integrity of the bright areas uh, in order to get the face to look right. Um, and so I'm shading around in a circle around her face, kind of. So I'm just building. So, you know, I shade the outside, I shade more of the inside, shade more of the outside, shade more of the inside, make adjustments if I don't think things look right. Uh, at one point, um, I will be, you'll see me rework this whole area here. This, this whole area is in shadow, so it can be simplified. It doesn't have to have all this kind of detail that I'm trying to put into it. That was me experimenting with the background and not liking it. A big blue flash. And I'm doing more toning of background. Here I start fixing some of those shadow areas. I simplify it. Just cleaning up, doing little housekeeping things of areas that I don't think look quite right. Moving that highlight on her talus that was not right the whole time. And adding in some darker areas, adjusting her chin. Making sure that the brightest part of this portrait is the sort of like that middle of her face as opposed to other parts of her, uh, like her neck or her ear. And adding texture and that's it. Hi, Ryan. Yeah. Quick question from the audience. Um, and I know that we'll probably be getting to this a little later, but yeah. do you have any tips for drawing the nose, particularly at this angle? Um, it's quite a difficult perspective to capture. Um, so honestly, uh, I mean, even my rendition is not quite right. I wasn't that worried about capturing the perfect nose. Um, The only way you can approach something like this is uh, from general to specific. So I will, I will, I'll go over drawing the nose uh, in general, but noses are always tricky, especially when people have uh, slightly longer noses and more delicate um, nostrils. 
like she does. So this this is this is always tricky. Yeah, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Uh, also, Ryan. So a lot of the models you've been referring to thus far for reference um, are quite natural looking, and I know that's an important aspect in order to establish your shadow shapes. Um, so how do you deal with situations where uh, your reference or your model might be wearing a lot of makeup and might distort your perception of shadow shapes? Um, well, I would say that um, if you are trying to learn, you should not be drawing from models with makeup. So the entire point of makeup is to hide flaws and part of hiding flaws is to more or less sculpt a new face and flatten the face. And that is just not good for actually learning when you're trying to observe natural forms of the face. So if you can, I would say uh, uh, avoid models with makeup. Uh, otherwise, um, I mean, otherwise, I mean, you do what you want otherwise, so. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions or? Yep, a question from the audience. Sure. Um, what do you think is consistently the most difficult part of doing a portrait for you? Or in general for artists? Um, I don't know. Sorry, I have never thought of that. The most difficult part of doing a portrait. I'll, I'll think about it as I'm talking. If I have an answer, um, I'll let you guys know, but I don't, I don't actually know. No. Are there any other questions or should I move on? Uh, yes, one more question from Ursulon. Uh, I didn't really understand what you meant about doing the light areas last. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so um, if you look here, if you look here, I am, so I've, I have everything filled in more or less and I have sort of like the shadow side filled in. So I am at some level ready to start rendering the light areas of her face. I have filled out the shadow sides and I have framed her face using her hair. So here, uh, when I start to render, you'll see that the brightest areas of her face is the center right here. Ho hopefully everyone can see my mouse. Um, this is the area that sh should be where the attention goes in the first place, uh, regardless. So, so this is the area that you want to be the brightest part of her face. You'll also see that the vast majority of the, uh, the brightest highlights on her face are all concentrated in this area. Um, on the bottom of the glabella here, the talus, the brow, uh, the edge of the top of the zygomatic here, uh, her nose, and uh, this junction between the nose and the cheek, here, all the bright highlights are centered in this part of the face. So you'll see that um, as I'm shading, I'm shading around, right? And yeah, it'll take me a little while to get to it, but you'll see that I'm sort of just shading around and you'll see every time I work that I don't start with shading the center here first. I, I'm working on uh, getting these areas right. See, so the shading happens around like this. So that, that's what I mean by um, uh, working around the, or saving the brightest areas for last almost. I'm not exactly saving it for last, but uh, they're the places that I want to be the most careful with because this area is dark, the image will lose its power at the end um, because you've left, you've uh, obliterated all the lights. Uh, another question from Andrew. Do huh? you recommend starting out on lightly colored or shaded backgrounds or would a white background be just as good? Um, lightly shaded, probably. It's usually easier to start from a lightly shaded background, I think. Especially because um, if you start from a white background like I did here, then uh, you have to work and work and work to shade everything in because you don't want to leave white, right? Uh, so lightly shaded, like maybe, I don't know, 15% gray, 10%, something like that, like uh, would be fine. And then when you put in your whites for your highlights, they will have that much more impact. Uh, 
another question. Sorry, I missed this one um, from Ananya. Uh, a question about observation. How do you observe and distinguish features belonging to different races and ages? Different races and ages. Um, so I, I don't quite understand the question. It was, uh, uh, how do you, how do you observe and distinguish between uh, features of different races and ages? So, yeah, I don't I don't quite understand the question because they are all the same to me. Like uh, a feet, you know, like a nose is a nose. They're just different shapes, and like so. Yeah, so I don't quite understand. So would you say observation is um, the key in helping to define the different features across races? So different, I mean, there are, uh, generally speaking, different, different races or even different ethnicities um, have uh, generalities in terms of their face structure that are, um, that are uh, common to them. So, uh, for example, uh, it's uh, if you're if you are um, if you are black or white, then you tend to have more of a muzzle. While if you're Asian, your face tends to be flatter. Um, you tend to have a more prominent brow if you are either Caucasian or African origin as well, Middle Eastern. Pretty much everyone except Asians. Um, so, and then, I mean, like talking about like really old people and really young people is a whole nother thing. I mean, like uh, really young people is just basically Disney. Like <laughs> if you see the way uh, Disney characters are drawn, they're all uh, drawn in a much younger fashion. And those, those proportions are for uh, like younger uh, adolescents or like children. And in terms of older people, I guess one thing to notice is to notice their noses and ears. Their noses and ears tend to be larger than uh, the quote unquote average that is taught um, because your noses and ears continue to grow um, throughout adulthood slowly, but they do. Um, so you will see that difference sometimes. But there are definitely difference uh, between, um, between the races. It's, they're just generalities though. Every, every person's face is different, so um, yeah. Um, and another question from Andrea Kim. Hi, Andrea. Uh, do you have any tips on how the neck connects to the head? Yes, um, I can. Uh, I can go and. Uh, how much time do we have? Actually, I want to make sure. Oh, we don't have that much time, do we? Okay. Um, maybe that's something I'll go over later at the end. We, sure. We're, pretty sure on time now. I don't know, like, you know, if people only have an hour for this. I'm so sorry, guys. We're definitely going to run over at this point. Okay. Um, are there any, one more, one more question. I will, I'll remember the neck. Yeah. Um, I believe that's all we have for now. So feel okay. free to move on to the next section. Okay. All right. So next section, I am going to go over the features and I'm only going to go over little bits of the features. Um, you know, I'm not going to explain everything. I can't. Um, I couldn't with the amount of time we'd allotted for this, and definitely can't now. <laughs> so, features. Start with the eyes. Uh, all I want to point out for the eyes is that, uh, and we should know this as uh, the vast majority of us here are uh, medical illustrators, is that the eye has a bulge because the cornea. So do not. So if you are drawing the um, if you are drawing the uh, eye up close, you want to have that slight bulge for the cornea. Um, and uh, otherwise, you know, if you're just drawing the eye like far away, just like a little eye here, then there's no point, it doesn't matter. Um, because of this bulge, the, the highlight hits the bulge here, or the light rather, hits the bulge right here, and you get this little highlight. And because the iris is concave, uh, the light passes through and uh, lights up the opposite side. And that's why you get uh, a light side opposite of the highlight when you're looking at the eye. So just remember that. Um, one thing that 
I sort of see sometimes uh, that doesn't help when it comes to portraiture, if you're doing anything realistic or even doing a quick sketch, is not observing the fact that the eyelids curl around the eye and has thickness. So you see there's thickness here from the eyelid. And so it sticks out. So when you're drawing the eye, I tend to draw it like this, where like even if I'm drawing, you know, if I'm drawing a quick eye, the, the side that has uh, the side that is curving away, I will draw two lines or a thicker line right here, and that kind of gives you that kind of gives you the um, the thickness of the eye curling around curling around your eye, and that'll give it that much more believability. And it's not a big thing; it's just a little thing right here. But it's helpful. It keeps your eye from just looking, you know, just from looking flat. Like, or just, or just like this. The eye looks flatter. So this, this alone gives it that thickness. Um, and that's it for the eye. Uh, so when it comes to the nose, um, I notice that a lot of noses that I see in general, when it comes to portraiture. People don't know quite what they're doing with the nose. Um, the nose itself actually has structure. It doesn't have bones, but it's got cartilage. And that cartilage gives it a very distinct uh, structure. So I put different colors here. Um, we have the wing of the nose, and then we have the ball of the nose. So wing and ball. Um, I don't know what this is called, and I apologize. But uh, this is another piece of cartilage. And then here is the nasal bone. So these are the four sections of the nose that I always think about uh, when I'm drawing a nose. And um, if I remove this, you can see that uh, you know even if you were to draw a nose like this and leave these lines in, the nose feels very uh, three-dimensional, sculptural, even. Um, and uh, understanding that you know, understanding that this nose here has a piece of cartilage that runs through like this helps you realize that when you're looking at a nose, you're not looking at just like, you know, kind of like a, a ball and like a wing like this, right? You're not just sort of like looking at a nose like that. You, you realize that the nose has, there's like a bump that runs through here like this. Um, and so when you look at people's noses, if you observe carefully, usually this sort of uh, form is extremely subtle. It's extremely, extremely subtle, but the form is there. Um, and so that will help you when you are drawing noses. So, oh, uh, noses from below. Make sure you remember that when you're drawing them from below, that the base of the nose is curved because your mouth is curved. Remember I said how the mouth was situated on this sort of round lemon slice, right? Well, the no your nose sits on top of that, right? And so therefore the base of the nose or the back of the nose, as it were, is uh, rounded. And here I've, uh, I'm gonna share this PSD with everybody afterwards, but here you can see that I've drawn a couple different noses and um, I've just highlighted the different areas of the noses just to show you how they're broken apart. And so if you look at these highlighted areas, yeah, it looks obvious, um, but, where do I turn this off? Here we go. Uh, the way I've drawn the noses here, so these are, you know, I, I looked up actual models and I drew these noses. The way I've made the marks helps define the different aspects of the nose. Um, so like, you know, the wing of the nose is here and I have drawn these little slash marks to show that, you know, this divides the wing of the nose from the ball of the nose here. Um, and for me anyways, these, this is sort of like useful shorthand or quick drawing uh, markings that I make that help the nose feel more sculptural. They're visual cues, even if the person's actual nose doesn't have, you know, little uh, shading marks or double uh, slash marks on them. And uh, when it comes to actually drawing the nose, uh, this mostly, I, I drew this in mostly to show people what sort of my processes when I'm quick sketching. So, um, you know, if I'm looking at someone from the side, and I love drawing people's profiles there, it's easy to, easier to draw because you don't have to balance both sides and uh, uh, people's profiles are always interesting. Um, 
you know, I just, I'm just showing here, like, I got notes here, here I draw the bottom, here I'm drawing the bottom. Here I have put in a plane change because I know the ball of the notes is here somewhere, right? So I put in a plane change by making this other marking, right? Um, and then I know this area is that yellow cartilage that I was speaking about. Here's your nasal bone. So already with uh, essentially one, two, three marks, I've told you there's a ball, there is uh, another cartilage piece, and there's a bone. And then um, this next step here, I drew in the wing, and then I made a little mark to show where the top, the ball of the nose kind of stops. And here's the, uh, the shadow, um, the uh, shadow shape for the nose. And then I go back in and I refine that shadow shape, right? Like this is a ball, so it has its own shadow shape here. And then this is a wing, it's like a teardrop shape almost, has its own shadow shape, right? So you have the ball and you have the wing, they each have their own shadow shape and you've got the nose, more or less, and then like the nostril, that's it. Um, and when it comes to uh, nose in three quarter view, it's a little more complicated, but uh, it's always it's always a guessing game. And so I draw, you know, I try to figure out, you know, if I if I have the eyes here somewhere, right, then I try to figure out where the nostril is, you know, I'm, and I'm drawing in the face. I try to figure out how wide the nose should be, and I will just make a mark like this, you know, and I'll, and you know, they're educated marks, but I'll make marks sort of putting where the side of the nostrils will be, depending on the size of the nostril. Um, and usually I'm slightly off. So, you know, uh, I have the middle of the nose here. You know, I try to figure out, here's the ball. And uh, I will figure out generally where the shadow, the, um, the uh, shadow shape is. And I know that the nostrils are below that shadow shape, at least the very common top-down view. I draw on the nostrils. And I just slowly start to fill in everything else. Like here's the wing, here's the rest of the ball of the nose. I draw the center line down here to help me get an idea of what the center of the nose should be. So I don't go off kilter and I refine the side here. So I, I drew it too wide. And yeah, that's it. Um, but this, the nose is always really hard. Everyone, everyone's noses are different. There is, you know, there is a huge variety of noses. So the nose can be very difficult. Um, are there any questions regarding this? No, no questions. No? Go ahead. Okay. Cool. So next part is the mouth. Um, the mouth is broken up into three sections and, or the top of the mouth rather is three sections. I've drawn it here. The center, um, the center green section here has uh, precedence over the two sections below it. So that's why when you draw, um, when you draw a lip, you draw the center and then the other two are um, coming out of it because the, this form is in front. And the, therefore, these are overlapping behind it. And the bottom part is sort of like two pads. That's how I think of it anyways. Um, and I drew this just because I wanted to say when you're drawing the mouth from any sort of angled view of the face, uh, there is overlap. So you should, you should always be thinking about this overlap. And so, so drawing the far side of the lip out a little bit and then drawing the uh, rest of the lip down like that helps you give that dimensionality, get that dimensionality because of the overlap. Um, again, this is not always true for people, for, but for most people, uh, the top the top of the lip juts out further than the bottom of the lip. So you want to observe that. And uh, when it comes to the flesh in the mouth, uh, it curls in at the corners like this. I think I, whenever I see this, I always think of it as like a little black hole. I mean, it makes no sense to think of it like that, but that's what pops in my mind. And uh, because of that, um, when you look at the actual value of the, the, um, if you're shading a mouth, then you'll realize that this inner part here is like darker, this part is lighter, and then you'll have a little bit of lightness here. It's ever so faint, but it's almost always there. 
um, unless they're older and then the skin starts to droop over, uh, then that, that becomes uh, obliterated. But um, as long as that, that hasn't happened yet, you will see a little light part here, and then you'll see uh, it get darker again. So when you're rendering that area, uh, it's always good to remember that you have this uh, kind of inward pulling uh, from all the muscles uh, from the rest of your face. And um, I have two more parts about the mouth. So one is um, do not outline the mouth as much as possible. Try to keep the, uh, the, your edges of the mouth uh, very light and reserve your darkest areas for uh, points of overlap and points of where the lines of the mouth converge. So, um, so that would be the corners. That would be the center. Um, and when you overlap, when you outline the mouth, uh, you draw attention to the mouth. You do not want the person's, the viewer of your portrait to look at the mouth. There's no point in looking at the mouth. We want to look at people's eyes, right? Like when we look at when we talk to each other, we look at each other's eyes. We look for meaning in what the other person is saying through their eyes. Uh, we are not looking at their mouth. So, uh, don't emphasize the mouth any more than you need to. And, uh, I've drawn here like how, you know, how little you really need to draw a mouth. It's literally just one, two, three dark sections, maybe a little shadow, shadow form here and a little bit for the top of the mouth and you have the mouth already. That's all you need. You don't need the, you don't need the rest of this. It's, it's pointless. Um, and when it comes to teeth, I just drew a little mouth here. Also teeth, um, the problem with teeth is that uh, the teeth is an area of a lot of detail. And when you draw out the person's teeth, every single tooth, um, it's going to create an intense amount of detail there, unless you do it extremely lightly. And it's, again, going to cause the viewer of your work to look at their mouth. You don't want them to look at the mouth. So uh, you, can put in, you can put in very light lines, like I did here. You can put like a, I like to put in like that little bit of gum when someone's like smiling or has their mouth open much more. A little bit of the gum shows here, or maybe even like over here, you can put that in. Um, and that starts to help frame like the teeth. Um, you can put in a little bit of shading so it gets like lighter as it moves out. But I would not put too much detail into the teeth. If you are going to put detail into the teeth, you need to detail the rest of the face that much more intensely before you start putting in detail into the teeth. Okay. Any questions about the mouth? No questions. Okay. Okay, now for the ear, um, last feature of the face. Um, so I don't really, I mean, I will draw the ear uh, true to the model, but oftentimes when I'm drawing somebody uh, in public, especially the ear is kind of like the last place you get to, right? Like. Uh, everyone's ear is different, but it's also the same. And it's not really uh, important for likeness other than sort of like the outline of the ear, you know, especially if someone has, if someone has ears that really stick out, right, then, you know, you want to get that. But the inside of the ear, usually not that important, not that identifying. Um, I would encourage you to draw the ear, you know, faithfully if it's there. But if it's not there, I just resort to sort of like a default ear. Um, and the the default ear has enough detail that you can just sort of pop, pass it off as like a real ear. So um, there is, uh, I guess, four main parts to the default ear. Um, so here is that default ear that I was talking about. And then I've just drawn in some uh, portions of it. So the way I draw an ear, is I always draw it on the slant because the ear is on a slant on the face. It's not straight. So I'll draw the slant. I'll draw, um, I don't know all the terminology for the ear, so apologize for that. But I draw this outer uh, sort of curve of the ear that we all know, it's the top of the ear. And then I'll draw this little tab shape here. Uh, don't know what that's called either. <laughs> Anyways. It, the tab is called a tragus. Thank you. Um, 
and uh, and then I will draw like a little U shape. So I'm drawing this U shape because I'm preparing for this Y shape here, right? It's it's like a it's like your old school Y. It's like that, right? So I'm drawing this Y shape here, and then there's another little bump right here. So I draw the little bump in, and you complete the Y. And then uh, there is the outside of the Y over here, which actually goes usually goes down like this. It, it goes like that, but that doesn't look good. So I don't do that. And um, sometimes when it comes to drawing faces, I just draw what looks good. I don't worry myself with what's right. Um, and so I'll make a little note there, say it continues. And then like a little division here. And that's all. So the ear is just, you know, the ear is just basically and there you have it. It's just that. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, just a note from Felix Wheeler. Uh, mm -hmm. He gave us some anatomy terms for portions of the ear. So the tab is a tragus. Bump mm -hmm. is the antitragus, and the Y shape is the antihelix, okay. or antihelix but prophelix. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. Um. And I have some ears that I drew here of like from the front, but you know you can vary your ear as much as you want. Um. There's, I mean, there's a wide variety of them, so. Okay, so are there any questions about the ear or? No? Nope, I don't think we have any further questions. Okay, so um, I'm going to do a demo uh, after I talk about this. So this is, this is stylizing um, the, way, the way I do it. I mean, I just, so I, I started to stylize the portrait maybe a couple of years ago, um, uh, just because I wanted to do something other than uh, realism. I just wanted to be able to break the face. And so I just have a specific way I like of stylizing faces. I tend to like, um, well, I tend to strongly favor female faces. Um, and because my way of stylizing uh, works with them the most. Um, I like large eyes. I tend to shrink the nose, give it a smaller bridge. Um, and I will leave like lines here, like rhythm lines. Um, and I'll draw like little circles for highlights. I mean, this is a very sketchy, not uh, rendered portrait. So, and uh, usually when I draw these sorts of faces, uh, I'm just looking for some sort of emotion, just a feeling. I, I can't even explain what the feeling is sometimes. Uh, so I'm just looking for that feeling and I'm chasing it. I mean, I guess that's what makes an artist an artist, right? Um, so anyways, so uh, I am way over time but it's okay for me to do this demo, yes? Or should we? I think, uh, I I think we're okay. Um, I think we're fine. If, if anyone needs to leave, um, they're free to, to leave. We do have this recorded. Um, so if you feel like you're missing anything, uh, it'll all be captured in the recording. Um, but there will be, or Annie, correct me if I'm wrong, but we'll still have time for a Q&A session at the end. So if you do yes. wish to ask questions to stick around. Yeah, I was actually thinking that um, if it's all right with Brian, uh, we can just uh, have the Q&A session while he uh, draws. Uh, sure. And yeah, you guys can turn on your mic so that we can have more of a conversation going. Um, yeah. OK. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to do a um, stylized version of the portrait that you had seen earlier. Um, I'm going to warn you guys that my uh, stylized portraits are not clean they're messy they're not you know they're i'm breaking the features and i'm just sort of moving things around or trying to find something that works sometimes i, I will start in a portrait and just like stop because it's just not working hopefully that won't be the case this time well i won't stop i'll just keep going until it, it crashes and burns but anyways um if people have questions and stuff we can uh do that too Ryan, yeah. do you do like a portrait in one sitting usually or because I, I, I know you do a lot of like observational portraits um, and you do this when you're commuting. Do you ever like go back to it 
and, and like clean it up again or rework it or yeah like I, yeah yeah all the time um i'll i'll go back to old portraits and i will like just add more shading i'll just make up uh highlights and stuff um just sort of making things up because when you're doing a quick portrait you really need to um you really need to uh just capture the essence of the face and then after that you're sort of relying on your own knowledge of um you're relying on your own knowledge of what the uh face should be like oh um, so this is when the riley method comes in then yes yes it's just experience and riley method yeah both Uh, we have a question from Leanne, longtime fan, first time commenter. Uh, when can we expect to see your portrait work in a debut gallery show? <laughs> There's no plans for that right now. Thank you for your <laughs> question, Leanne. A question from Paul Kelly. Who is your favorite artist with an S in parentheses? Um, let me see. Actually, <laughs> I just have a small list right here. But so one of my, so I think anyone who follows the art world, um, well, not anyone, sorry. The, like the current sort of uh, group of artists might know an artist, internet artist anyways, might know an artist named Boish. So she is probably one of my bigger influences. Um, mm -hmm. But there is, I have a couple more that I really like. Not necessarily influences, but people that I'm looking up to right now. One is a guy named Thomas uh, Chamberlain Keen. Um, and uh, there is a Korean artist, she's young, but she's extremely good by the name of T.B. Choi. Um, there is a Japanese artist who posts on Twitter named uh, Ray underscore 17. Um, there is the, the OG father of concept artists right now, who, um, whose name is uh, Craig Mullins. Um, and um, there is an artist I really like who posts on Instagram. Uh, I, she has a website as well. Her name is uh, Eliza Ivanova. So those are my current favorites that I'm looking up to right now. A question from Tay, is there a good way to figure out which way the head is tilted? Uh, just by, I guess, just by comparing the eyes. What do you mean by the way it's tilted, like tilted back or forward or side to side? Because side to side is easy, you just look at the eyes. Um, and you can you can do it that way. Uh, in terms of back and forward, um, here. So, uh, in terms of back and forward, all you have to do is uh, you just go. You just make two straight lines uh, at the brow, at the nose, and if this ear is uh, below those uh, the straight line of the face, like if you consider the face to be like this, that if the ear is below, then the t face is tilted up. And if the ear is above this, then the face is tilted down. Sorry, I just want to correct myself. I pronounce um, Taya's name wrong, sorry. Um, a question from Farah. Do you apply this method to other body parts, such as hands? Yes. So there is a Riley method for the rest of the body. And no, I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, that's something I'm still learning. Not the Riley method for the body. Um, I started learning that and then uh, had to stop. Um, but yes, there is.
So I want to keep the sort of dead look in our eyes. I like that feeling for some reason. Because um, there's no highlights in her eyes. It's not that she's actually dead inside. I mean, she might be, but. Um, and usually when it comes to the eyes, uh, I will try to preserve kind of like the ratios of the different parts of like the way she looks. So like she's got this, uh, the creased eyelid here, and it's thicker. Uh, up, it's thicker over here than it is over here, so I will preserve that. Um, she's got sort of like an almond shape to her eye too, so I'm going to preserve that as well. Um, the eyebrow, you know, you can do whatever you want with it, but she's got this like point, like very stylish kind of points, and then down. So I might look to exaggerate that. Even. So with this kind of stylizing that I do, um, usually the uh, oops, the the forehead is uh, smaller than your normal three quarter view. So. So we shouldn't see too much of the bottom of her nose because I have her bending her head down in this version of her. And this is the outer wing of her nose that I just put in. So I just made this circular motion here, trying to get a grasp of where I think her cheek will be. And um, I have her bending her head down more. So if you know, if I'm if I'm doing this, the ear should be inside of here. So the ear will be above the above the eyebrow because I have her head bending down. So that's I'm going to do it. Hey Ryan. Yeah. Um, when you do these portraits, I really like how you think about narrative. I mean, it's it's a portrait, so it's not like the first thing that you think about. But I like that you think about your characters and your portraits that way. Um, do you have like a different workflow compared to like drawing people you don't know versus people that you do know? Like, I mean, when I say workflow, I guess like way of thinking about the portrait. Um, when it comes to people I do know, I tend to focus more on likeness. I, I can't help it. It's you, you want them to look like, you know, uh, when, you sh when you draw a picture of somebody and you show them, I'm sure if we've done this before, everyone feels the same. You want the other person to be like, oh, yeah, that looks like me, right? You don't want them to be like, who's that, right? So um, I do focus maybe a little bit less on narrative and more on likeness. But I do think about, um, I tend to like the sort of like con con uh, contemplative or contemplative or slightly lost look on people's faces. It seems kind of peaceful. So I go for that a lot. So if we're looking down at her, or she's had her head tilted down, um, you'll see less of the jaw. Uh, so I'm going to be probably playing with uh, showing less of the jaw here. If it looks weird, then I'll just bring it back. It really doesn't matter. Again, she's got some hair coming out. Um, one thing I didn't mention was uh, when I'm drawing faces, um, when you're trying to figure out where the jawline is, there's a tendency, I think, for a lot of people, including me, to be honest, where the jawline gets too long, right? You're drawing, drawing, it gets too long here. 
So I don't know if this is the best way, but what I always do is I sort of find the angle either from the um, from the the end of the eyebrow here or the side of the eye right here, and I just draw that to uh, this angle of the jaw here, right? Um, and that gives you an idea of like, well, you know, is my jaw is my jaw too low or is it too high or is it too far, right? Or is it too close? Um, and so. If you do make up portraits a lot, then you'll get a sense of what's like a nice angle, or you'll have your own variation of what that nice angle is, and you'll use it. Um, and that's what I'm doing right here. Let me change my eraser. So I'm doing all of these, I'm doing this drawing just with your regular uh, hard round. And the eraser, I'm using a, uh, just a soft eraser, a uh, soft uh, round, uh, soft edged eraser with the opacity at like 40%. So I don't obliterate all my marks. Since again, I ever had to tilt it down. So I'm going to draw her ear this. Brian, would you be able to comment a little bit more about um, how the neck connects to the head? I know it was brought up earlier by yeah. Andrea. Yeah. Okay, so uh, part of the way the head connects to the neck. Um, so in a three-quarter view, it starts from the right behind the ear, right? If you just look at, port, you know, it's starting right behind the ear, ear for her here. Um, and then in terms of, you know, where are you going to put the front of the neck when you're making something up? It's up to you. But at some point, it, look, it starts to look weird, right? Like this is she doesn't she doesn't look like she's gonna live much longer. So, um, you know, you put the neck down, and then or you put the other far side of the neck down. So, you have to remember that um, the neck is. So if you have if you have if you have a head here, and then you have it, the neck connecting. Um, there's there's the sternocleidomastoid muscles. Uh, wrapping around to the front here like this, right? I did not draw this head very well, I apologize. So what I do is I remember, I, I, I'm thinking about this. I could have done a whole section on this actually. Let me, let me erase this. So I'm thinking about this. So what I'll do, and you'll see me do it in a second is I'm thinking about the bottom of her head here. I'm thinking about the sternocleidomastoid coming out, wrapping around, coming down to um, the pit of her neck over here. And I'm thinking from the far side, um, the sternocleidomastoid also coming down, wrapping around like this, and then coming out, right? So coming down like this. So you'll have so you'll have the cylinder, you have the cylinder of this neck like this, but then you'll have these forms coming out from the sternocleidomastoid. Um, that. So I will, so I'm going to actually draw this if I can get back far enough. Um, so when I draw this, maybe the pit of the neck should be further in front here. And then you have uh, the, the, vo the uh, larynx sticking out here as well. So I'll have this, these forms like this. And we can draw our shoulders. draw her far shoulder here and um, it's too dark 
we can draw sort of like the handlebar shape of her clavicle here. And then we have another, I forget what muscle this is, but there's another muscle that comes out, reaches, reaches out and connects to, to the clavicle. It's coming out meeting it here like that. So that's how I would start drawing the neck. So basically you have, there's no particular name for the shape of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, but it wraps around the cylinder of the neck and you need to account for that wrapping. Um, not when you're drawing the inside here, although it's useful to draw this form, but when you're drawing the outside here, it'll curve around. Oops. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's how I approach the neck. And if you're stylized, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I'll let you finish with the next. Sorry, I thought you were done. No, no, I'm, I'm done. It's, it's fine. Okay, okay. Uh, a question from Colleen. Uh, do you typically do all of this on one layer? The drawing? Yeah. Yeah, it's all in one layer. Uh, it, would, it would just be irritating if it was on multiple layers. I'd have to, I'd, I'd want to fix something and then I'd have to go hunt the layer down. Um, so yeah, this the drawing is all in one layer. Hey Ryan, can I ask you a question about the jawline? So yeah. I noticed that the line weight sort of varies from the tip of the chin to like back of the ear. Can you sort of explain how you approach drawing the jawline and how those line weights oh, sort of, right. yeah. Okay, sure. Um, so basically uh, you draw a jaw like this and uh, you're basically visually cutting the head off the neck, right? You're giving her the Mary Antoinette treatment. Um, so when you're so drawing in general, um, you don't want to explain to the viewer everything that's happening, right? When you're drawing, when you do a drawing and you present to somebody, it's a dialogue between you and the person that's looking at it. Okay, it's just visual. So what you do instead is you create moments where the viewer themselves has to make the connections about what's happening. And the way you do that, specifically when it comes to the jawline, is um, if we're just assuming a regular, you know, top-down light like this, then there's going to be uh, there's going to there's going to be a shadow shape here, right, all along the jaw, right. But what you can do here is you can thicken some areas of the shadow, so like here, it's like darker, right. And then this is maybe there's a faint line here, but then you thicken the shadow that's coming over here. Right, and you're creating like this thick and then thin, almost non-existent. You can even almost erase it if you'd like, um, and then thick and then and then thick again. So that sort of rhythm is extremely pleasing to a viewer. Um, instead of you know when you draw when I draw a line, this line is different from from this line, right? This one is way more interesting. They're both lines. They're both from point A to point B, but one is more interesting than the other. So um, that's the kind of line you should be trying to achieve when you're trying to do a jawline. Um, you don't want to cut the head off from the rest of the body. Um, I have another question on shadows. So how do you choose which shadows? Because I noticed when you're, style, when you're stylizing, you don't draw all the shadows. You choose certain shadows. So like, why do you choose certain shadows? And like, do you have any other tips in how you stylize them? Um, so... Those are just shadows that honestly, I'm just used to. Uh, it, there's almost, I mean, some of them are just nice. Like I've drawn them a lot and I've decided that they're nice shadows, but they're also shadows that I'm just used to. Um, so if you draw lots of portraits, you'll find shadow shapes that you really like that you think are, are beautiful shadow shapes and you will tend to include them. Um, I also like to draw shadow shapes that are uh, just useful. So like, um, this area of the eye right here. I mean, you can't see it on her so much because I don't know exactly what is going on if her brow just isn't that deep. But there usually is like a shadow shape right here that uh, you see in a lot of people, uh, uh, African and Caucasian uh, in origin, or rather just non-Asian. Um, you see it on Asians, but it, it tends to look more like her here, like very faint. Um, that shadow shape, I will draw in a lot. It also helps kind of set the eye into a socket if you draw that in. Um, I like to draw in the shadow shape, like, you know, if I kept going with her nose right here, I would draw the shadow shape in like this. 
like with her nose. Um, and then I would draw in like a little little shadow shape for it doesn't it actually doesn't have to be complicated. I would just draw in like that even. That's not good. Something like that for the bottom of her nose. Um, this little this little tab on at the neck, I always like this one. So I just keep uh, I just put that one in. Um, and oh yeah, use, usually I put in like a, just a small shadow shape at the bottom of the lip right here. Um, I do, you know, like I'm still learning and I'm still learning like what's good and what's bad or, you know, what necessarily should be there versus doesn't need to be there. And sometimes you don't have to, you know, you don't want to become dogmatic in your drawings. If you, if I always put in a shadow shape here and always put in a shadow shape there, it's always the same. My portraits are going to start to look all the same. So I'm aware of that. So sometimes I change things just to change them, just to see what they'll look like. So here's the bottom of her cheek. Um, she's got like, she's got this, I, I can't, I think this is makeup, but I really have no idea. So um, someone else more educated than me can tell me. Um, but she's got that dark side there. So I might put a little bit of that in just to, just cause I like the feeling. Put in the crease of her uh, top of her eyelid here. And um, the nose is usually has more, a little more uh, blood than other areas. So it tends to be a little bit darker. So I might put in like a little highlight here and then shade in the nose very lightly. We don't want the nose to be a shadow, like the whole nose to be uh, in shadow. We just want it to uh, slightly uh, be shaded. So it kind of sticks out. And I didn't pay attention to sort of like her eye bags. So I am putting in her eye bag, like rounded in her eyes. I might start shading in the eyes here just to give her. So I've given her instead of sort of that kind of like model look that she has, she's a little more like maybe mischievous looking. She's got that little frown and her mouth is open. Like she's thinking about something and she's slightly smiling in mine. So, and I put in like a little highlight, like I just like this, the shape of this highlight. So I'll put this in often, uh, although I probably shouldn't put it in too much, but I do just like it. Um, there's a, another shape here you see a lot. It's this shape right here. So you see it on her face from the series of highlights side of her nose like this. It looks, looks like that almost, or it could be just this. So that's the plane change from her nose to her cheek. It's the, the flesh moving in that, dire in that direction like that. Um, so that's where you get that highlight. And so I'll put in this little shape right here to sort of uh, indicate, indicate that highlight. Um, And uh, if I want to start marking in some of the highlights in her forehead, or so the uh, shadow sides in her forehead, uh, just because I'm drawing from this photo doesn't uh, mean that I have to put in the shadow shapes the same, right? Uh, but if I want to, I can start doing that a little bit. It's like, um, I could give her her, what do you call this? Sorry, the only word I can think of in my head is butt chin, but that's probably not the right word. It's definitely not the right word. Cleft? Cleft chin? Okay, thank you. My apologies. Um, I'll put in, instead of trying to put in both sides of the filter like this, when you put in two lines that are sort of running parallel to each other, they become like a powerful magnet for the eyes. Um, so if you're going to put in the second line, it should be like lighter or like slightly different, differently angled. But for this one, I will just put in one and hopefully the, the viewer of this drawing will, you know, put the other one in with their mind. So I don't have to do the work. So 
shape this in the neck here. Um, here it's coming down. So this this shadow form here that's that's moving up like this, this is the top of your sternocleidomastoid. So this whole shadow form here is very light. Um, so I'm going to probably just pull my pull my uh, uh, stylus just across that like that. Erase that a bit. Hey, Ryan, can I ask yeah. you a question on how you would approach making a character look, look more masculine or feminine? I find that sometimes when I draw, like either you know, female character or male character, that um, they might look one or the other, and like I might not know how to push them to that. Like, do you have any tips on like weight or what you're looking for in terms of that? Uh, so for masculine, for masculine, honestly, if you if you were to draw the character with just straight lines <laughs> the whole time, they would look more masculine. First off, that's sort of like the language of line. Um, soft, soft sort of curves like this. This the character is going to look more feminine no matter what. So you know, let's say like. You know, if I have a if I have a nose, if I have a nose, um, if I draw the nose like this, like, you know, like this, it's gonna feel more masculine than if I draw the nose like this, like, soft, right? Um, also, with men, the biggest thing I guess would be um, the proportions of the face. So, like, for women, for women, I uh, here you see that like. Uh, well, she's not dividing the thirds anymore, but she's got the thirds thing going on a bit, right? Well, for men, um, what you want to do is you want to uh, draw the head so that, so let's see, here's the brow. Well, yeah, here's the brow, here's the forehead. Here's the bottom of the nose. And then here's an extra long uh, nose to jaw. This, this will automatically make them seem more masculine. Um, this will make them seem more masculine. and uh, when you are, here, a second. When you are drawing in the area of the jaw for the ear, if you kind of angle the jaw like this more, so it's like this smooth like this, that feels more feminine. But if you give them a deep, like this early part of the jaw that descends from the ear, if you make this deep like this, like a heavy set jaw, if you accentuate that, that they have, this will make them look automatically uh, more masculine. Oh, and smaller eyes. I mean, it's really hard to make a guy look uh, masculine if you give him huge eyes like this. Um, it'll, be a, it'll be a struggle. What about lips, Brian? Because I find that, um, I mean, fuller lips are very difficult to, to reconcile with masculinity in a, in a yes. portraiture setting. Yes, yes. Um, so I've come across this when uh, drawing African men. So the only thing I would say about that is um, when you're drawing uh, male lips, and also my lips are pretty full. And so, you know, I can tell you right now, it's been a struggle drawing my own face and not trying to make myself look like a girl. Um, so what I would say is that you just don't put in so much detail. like. For women, you know, you start, you draw lips, you draw the little, like, little, like, pinches, these little curves. You give them, like, little uh, boat, uh, Cupid's bow sort of thing going on, right? And this, this looks more feminine, right? For men, um, for men, if you just, uh, if you just draw in kind of, like, uh, the broad features, and also male lips tend to be more broad in general. So female lips will be a little bit tighter, I find. Like the, this, this little part right here tends to be a little bit tighter and it pulls in like this. For men, it doesn't. It, it tends to be broad and like more stretched out, right? And so if you draw the lips like that, uh, they will be 
I don't know about more masculine, but less feminine. Um, yeah. Uh, if anyone has any last minute questions, we will be wrapping up in a couple of minutes. Um, so if you have any burning desires, uh, please ask them now. Uh, Ryan, yeah. um, how do you control your line weight so well for when you're drying, as you're drying? What do you mean? Like, uh... Like deciding what lines are going to be thick or like, um, you know, as you're sketching out, do you just do, just think about your line weight at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I try to save like my thickest lines for something like the eyes. Um, so I press the hardest near the eyes and maybe like some places around like the eyebrow, like if I'm, you know, if I'm carving out the shape for the eyebrow. Uh, but, um, and I try to, yeah, I think part of it is just practice. It's like your own taste and practice. It just comes down to what you like to see. Um, I tend to like, for me, like when I'm drawing a form, when I'm drawing a form like this and I'm curving down around like that, like right when it curves, I tend to make it dark and then I lighten it. And then as it turns again like this. Um, so like you'll see it like it gets dark here, like I darken and then it gets light like at the bump and then when it sort of like when this this line and this line meet it gets slightly darker again here so that's just my tendency and that's what I like to see um, I think the the question of line weight and where the line should be uh, heavier or lighter is kind of a personal one uh, beyond the aspect of does it look good or does it not look good? Ryan, what's your opinion on um, like line smoothing uh, utilities like Lazy Nozumi? Um, uh, if you're having others. trouble, yeah. So if you're having trouble with uh, keeping your lines smooth, then sure, go ahead and uh, use Lazy Nozumi. I would say that it may come down to a problem in your technique, maybe, maybe, this is not a definite, just a maybe, um, in your setup. So uh, my setup, I, I have a, um, I have a uh, tablet monitor that allows me to sort of almost put the, the screen in my lap. And um, oh, yeah. like, you know, I sit, well, my monitor's not that big, sorry, it's like this big. And then I sit and I can draw like this, right? Um, and this allows me to draw from my arm, not from my elbow, or partially from my elbow and not from my wrist. If your lines aren't like nice and they're kind of jagged, you might be because of the fact that you're using uh, your wrist a lot. So you want to try to find a setup that kind of gives you like this angled setup. And so you're like looking down on it. Um, and so you can just move your move your whole arm to get nice smooth lines. Um, barring that, I would just say, go ahead and use lazy Nizumi. Like there's no shame in using something like that. Um, but like, hopefully you're able to get uh, nice smooth lines when you're uh, using traditional materials. So it won't be a question of uh, your technique. Also, it's better for your wrist, a uh, long-term, long-term drawing. Thanks. Yeah. Um. Okay. So thank you so much, Ryan. That was so much knowledge and I'm sure everyone mm -hmm. um, enjoyed that. Um, and also thank you everyone for coming. This has been really great to just connect with everyone um, and uh, sort of chat and draw yeah. together. Um, so just like a quick, re like just as a reminder that we did record this, so we will be uh, sharing that with everyone. Um, don't worry, no one's face will be on recording, it'll just be on the <laughs> screen. Um, and we will be also distributing the resources that uh, Ryan has mentioned. And I did notice that it seems like people might be drawing. So if you want to share um, on social media, we do have a hashtag going. Um, ha so the hashtag is BMCAA live. Um, so yeah. 
Uh, if, it was, if you were drawing, do share. Um, and just also lastly, uh, if you also want to share something through this live stream series, do reach out to us. Um, we can sort of uh, figure something out and be nice to feature more people from the community. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone. Yeah, hope thanks for coming out, everybody. I hope I hope uh, there was some information that was useful for everyone. So um, yeah, and uh, I hope that people grow to love portraiture as much as I do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you can see Ryan, but people are clapping. Oh, people are okay, clapping. Okay. <laughs> thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. See you at our next one.